Live from New York City, it's The Cube at Big Data NYC 2014. Brought to you by headline sponsor, WAN Disco, with support from EMC, MarkLogic, and Teradata. With hosts, Dave Vellante and Jeff Kelly. Welcome back to the Big Apple, everybody. This is day two of Big Data NYC. We're here concurrent with Strata plus Hadoop World. This is our Big Data NYC. We're here at the Times Square Hilton. Last night, we had a great event. We had a, our Capital Markets event. We had a room full of people listening to Jeff Kelly uh, present his scenario on big data, big data investment angles. Where do you play big data, right? There's only about three pure play companies, you know, they're not even really at the heart of the core of big data, Tableau, ClickTech, and Splunk. I mean, they're certainly big data related, uh, but the, the, the core infrastructure people, the, the tooling folks in big data really aren't public yet, the, the big distro vendors. We talked a lot about that, Cloudera, Hortonworks, and MapR. And then Jeff put forth the scenario uh, about investment angles, potentially finding people who are applying big data to their business and really looking at those as investment opportunities. So it was really uh, insightful. Jeff shared a lot of data uh, with the audience and it's, uh, that presentation is going to be up on SlideShare next week. And then we had a panel, which was absolutely phenomenal. Um, we had Peter Goldmacher, former Cowan analyst, uh, Amy O'Connor, who is an evangelist, big data evangelist at Cloudera and former head of Nokia's big data uh, operation, and then Avi Mehta, who built the first data factory at Bank of America, and now is uh, CEO of Traceda, and it was a really interesting discussion. Uh, Goldmacher, very much sort of negative on existing large software players, uh, although I think he capitulated on one of his scenarios and essentially yeah. viewed uh, Jeff, right, that they ultimately are going to win, the rich get richer, he said they always get richer, um, but at the same time was very um, antagonistic, I would say, toward uh, Cloudera's valuation. And uh, I thought Amy O'Connor really stole the show. Well, what happened was, I'll sort of set it up, Jeff, Goldmacher was essentially saying, hey, here's the deal, we live in this little echo chamber of big data in this Hadoop world, and uh, I'm in San Francisco, and you guys are in Boston, and we're now in New York, and we're all like all this love of big data, blah, 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 but the reality is when I fly over, this is Peter Goldmacher talking, we're talking, when I fly over all those states in the middle of the country, they don't give a, I won't say it, about it's a cube. You can Hadoop. Say it. No, I'm not saying it. Um, I personally don't swear in the cube, but they don't <laughs> give a hoot about Hadoop. You know, boom, boom, boom. And then they went on and had the discussion. Amy then chimed in and said, well, let me tell you something. That's nice that you fly over those states, but I land in those states. And then she started talking about all the sort of ways in which organizations in different industries are applying Hadoop. And really, that's her wheelhouse, uh, which I thought was really fantastic. And Jeff Frick pointed out to me, uh, Jeff, the other day, another guy who's sort of in that Amy O'Connor camp is a guy, uh, Bill Schmarzo, the dean of big data that we know well flying around all the time, talking to those, those, uh, those customers. And so that was fantastic. I really thought she held her own against sort of, and Avi and, and Peter were kind of ganging up on, uh, on Cloudera, but she really knocked it out of the park in my opinion. It was just great. We're going to have that, the video of that panel back up, but you know, the, the essence of it really was that the practitioners are doing some amazing things, but it is hard, as you pointed out in your presentation. It's going to take a long time. And the return on investment right now is not huge on big data. You showed data, Jeff, which I thought was really fascinating, that for every dollar spent on big data, on average, the, the return is 55 cents, which ain't very good. Uh, the goal of practitioners was to get three and a half X. And some, of, some, I forget who it was on the panel, said the real great big data practitioners are getting way more right. than three and a half X. And I, I, my comment was, Whoever's answering that question is not the CEO, because the CEO is looking for more. Mm -hmm. uh, and the, the transformative potential of big data is such that you would think it's a 10x play on an ROI basis. It's a 10 bagger, and I think it has to be. Um, but people in our surveys, you know, a combination of IT practitioners, maybe some line of business folks, much more conservative in their, pr in, in their projections, and I think underestimating the potential, but part of that is probably tainted by their existing experiences. Yeah, I agree. Um, clearly, you know, our thesis, our investment thesis that we put forth uh, yesterday was that 
Practitioners are going to be the big winners by far. They're going to create exponentially more value than big data vendors. Uh, and I agree. I think that, you know, that expectation of $3.50 back on the dollar uh, investment in big data technologies and services um, is really a lot lower than the reality at the companies that are going to be the winners. So the companies that do this well, the companies that leverage, um, as Abi pointed out, their uh, data sets that are unique to them, their their unique data sets that provide competitive advantage. Those companies are going to receive, uh, sorry, going to achieve significantly higher than than a 3x, 4x return on their investment. As you said, it's a 10x, it might be 20x, it could be much larger. Um, the That number is an average, which is important to keep in mind. Um, and I think it is in part tainted by what's going on in, in the early adoption phase. This stuff is challenging. It's, it's difficult from a technology perspective, but it's also difficult from a people and process perspective. Um, it's difficult from just, just identifying the most, uh, the best use cases to get started with is just a challenge. So um, I think you'll see that number go up. Um, you know, it, the question is where are we in kind of that adoption cycle? Are we in the trough of disillus disillusionment at this point? And you know, will that number go up um, in, the, in the short term or, or a little bit in the longer term? I think it is going to take a while for this market to really shake out and for a lot of the benefits to happen. And frankly, when we do hit this 10x, 20x, uh, return, which we're going to hit, some some companies are going to hit, it's going to be, you know, we're talking a long-term proposition here, five, ten years. We're not going to be calling it big data in, in that at that point. It's just going to be data. Um, we're extremely, I think, you know, your point uh, around Peter's comment around, you know, I fly over these states and nobody cares there. Um, Amy was right on. There are definitely companies in those states that do care and that are doing some interesting things. But I think Peter does have a point that it is going to take a lot longer than I think some believe it's going to take to, to hit r true mainstream adoption because this stuff is so challenging. Um, but when we do, there's going to be a huge opportunity for those companies that can uh, harness big data as part of this larger digital fabric. Big data doesn't live in a bubble. Um, there's other, uh, other areas around cloud, infrastructure as a service, social engagement. Um, trusted transaction processing, privacy, security. There's a whole number of areas that companies need to, to think about, and big data fits into that larger um, architecture approach. Uh, but you know, there is huge opportunity for those companies that can leverage that digital fabric, um, and part of that is big data analytics. I want to talk about that digital fabric a little bit. So the, the concept of dig digital fabric, really, and then that term was first put forth to, to me by a, a gentleman named David Michella, who is uh, the lead uh, team lead on the uh, CSC's leading executive forum, which is uh, essentially a think tank within uh, CSC that actually sells services to CIOs and the like. And his premise uh, that he shared with me is one that we sort of have been batting around here and sort of testing, is that historically industries, whether retail, manufacturing, finance, et cetera, have a stack, called a stack, of design, production, sales, distribution, partnerships, et cetera, that are, is pretty hardened and, and optimized for that particular industry. And his premise is that increasingly you're seeing horizontal layers that cut across that industry, one at the bottom being sort of what I would call infrastructure as a service and cloud, uh, and then above that you've got transaction systems, above that you've got social media now, and thinking about our social graphs and social profiles that traverse different industries whether it's Facebook, LinkedIn, uh, 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 and, and other types of reputation systems. Could be you know, Amazon, ratings, could be Yelp, et cetera, et cetera. <coughs> Excuse me, and then big data you know, on, on the top of the stack. And what his premise is is that organizations are building on top of that digital fabric, and the ones that can leverage that digital fabric the best are going to be the winners. And ultimately, they're going to be able to use those horizontal pipes to traverse industries. And it's a fascinating uh, a theory. Uh, and this guy has been, Dave Michelle, has really been right on with a lot of theories. He was the first to describe the, the, the notion that the industry, this is back in the 80s, that the notion is moving from a vertically integrated structure to one that was disintegrated. In other words, competition is occurring on, on individual layers of the value chain. So Intel is going to dominate microprocessors, and EMC is going to dominate storage, and Oracle is going to dominate database, and Microsoft is going to dominate PC apps. So he made that call way before anybody else understood it. And so I like to follow his thinking because he's always been ahead of the curve, and I think he's right on. And what, this is what you're seeing with Airbnb, uh, with, well certainly with Google, Amazon, and, and, and Facebook, but Airbnb, 
Uber, you used the example of Fitbit yesterday, and also you used a couple of interesting examples, I thought, UPS, uh, Coca-Cola, and GE, three existing organizations that are essentially, in a way, riding on top of that digital fabric, using data at that top. Mm -hmm. So Abby said something yesterday, interesting on the panel, it's not, <clears throat> it's not the data, that's the competitive advantage. It's how you create data that's different and how you apply it that creates mm -hmm. that competitive advantage. The data in and of itself is not the new source of competitive advantage. It's the differentiation of that data that creates the, the source mm -hmm. of competitive advantage. So I thought that was, um, that was pretty prescient. What were your takeaways from uh, the Capital Markets event yesterday? Well, you know, I, I, first of all, you know, I was, thanks everybody that turned out. Um, you know, we've been really excited about this, preparing for this for a while, and it was fun to, to for the day to get here and actually uh, put forth our, our thesis and, and present that. So, you know, had a lot of fun doing that. In terms of the panel, um, you know, it was, it was one of the more interesting panels I've ever been on. Um, it's great with the lineup that we were able to, to uh, put together. Uh, some outspoken folks with some really uh, interesting opinions. Uh, you know, my takeaway was, what struck me, I think, was one, uh, Peter Goldmacher's uh, evolving opinion of the role of and the likely outcomes for the startup vendors in this space. Um, he touched on some of them being overvalued, and frankly, when you when you get those kind of valuations, that puts a lot of pressure on these startups. Now you've really got to deliver. You've got you've got investors that are obviously want a pretty pretty big return here. So you've got to you've got to start making money, not just revenue. He's talking about profit, and we're a long way from that with most of these startups. Uh, so that struck me. He also seems to have evolved his position a little bit around what the outcome's going to be for companies like Oracle and Teradata, the, the industry heavyweights. Um, and you know, I think his, his take that the rich get richer, I think is probably accurate. However, I don't think it's going to happen in quite the way he was proposing. I think for the rich to get richer, for Oracle, for Teradata, for SAP to continue their dominance, I think they need to move a little bit higher up the value chain in the big data space around uh, integrating infrastructure and providing a kind of this virtual layer on top of the data lake and higher level services and software where they can actually help uh, companies put a lot of this stuff to use uh, and, and make the transition from the old to the new. Um, I think that's where they potentially could add value because I still f still believe that Hadoop NoSQL, the open source big data movement, is fundamentally disrupting the traditional database and data warehouse market. And so I don't think they can rely on those lines of business to continue fueling growth for them. They've got to look higher up the stack. Um, so I think Peter and I disagree a little bit on that. Um, you know, I think Abby's comment around, as you mentioned earlier, what you do with that data and your unique data assets was interesting. And, and uh, you know, what I would say to that is, you know, one way to look at that is, you know, company like Uber, they have unique data. They've got all the data that their drivers are creating and sending and all the transactions they have with their customers. So that's a unique data set and they're using that to drive pricing and to build their business. Uh, but there's also, unique data isn't necessarily created that discreetly. It's other ways organizations can create unique data sets is by bringing in outside data, merging that with their existing data, r doing analytics on that data, com coming up essentially with new data sets, new insights, and then leveraging that to drive their business. So just wanted to kind of expand on that topic a little bit. But in general, you know, the, the conversation was great. I thought Amy was, was fantastic, really provided some great uh, insight on what practitioners are really thinking. She comes from uh, her heritage at Nokia where she led that big data team. She's got uh, some great experience there and her stories about what she hears from customers and what they're concerned about. Um, you know, they're looking at what are these net new analytic applications we can build on this new emerging big data infrastructure, uh, this new emerging digital fabric uh, to really drive our business. You know, she talked a little bit about some of those cost saving things that people are doing around moving workloads, transformation workloads to Hadoop and using Hadoop as a uh, long-term archive to save on storage costs. Storage costs are going up, budgets are flat, and that makes sense. But the really interesting and really differentiating um, uh, potential of Hadoop, of big data, uh, are these net new analytic applications and workloads. So overall, I thought it was a great, great panel. Uh, I'm looking forward to doing it again next year. Uh, maybe we'll have a little reunion and get the, get the gang back together again. I thought uh, the other thing that was interesting was, because um, you and I had been talking about, like what happens if Oracle takes out a Cloudera? Now at this point, I think Cloudera's you know, <coughs> practically acquisition proof with a $4 billion valuation and all the money that's been raised, but we'll see. I mean, in theory it could happen. But if, just again, playing 
chess, chess moves, theoretical chess moves. If, if Oracle were to do that, my belief was that it would part the Red Sea for Hortonworks, because everybody who's non-Oracle customer would say, well, screw it, I'm not going to work with Oracle on that. They're going to lock me into the Red Stack, and I'm going to go work with Hortonworks. Goldmarker had a different take on that. He said, well, you know, Hortonworks and, and Cloudera, they're in this urinary Olympics. Cloudera says, well, we have 100 sales reps. Hortonworks says, well, we have 75, and blah, blah, blah. We have more, a bigger distribution channel, and now we got Intel. But his point was if Oracle, with 20,000 sales reps or whatever they have, <laughs> buys uh, a Cloudera or whomever, all of a sudden that distribution advantage goes away. I'm not sure. I'm not sure that a virtual ecosystem of distribution cannot match a single whale's distribution channel. It certainly can't within that whale's uh, customer base, but I think it can if you have the right connection points. Uh, and I think that um, there are examples of that in the industry. Uh, I think EMC is an example, but maybe not the best because they're already a very large company, but they're working that ecosystem probably as well as, as anybody else. Um, but I think that Peter's point, however, nonetheless, was, was interesting from the standpoint of if that is your primary advantage, it could be somewhat neutralized and maybe dramatically neutralized uh, uh, on an acquisition. Other things we talked about, just sort of riffing on, uh, on IPOs, you made this, the statement that you thought that Hortonworks would do an IPO first, uh, probably because they need to first. And, uh, what are your thoughts on the timing of that? Do you, you, I know you don't have any inside information, but what, what does your gut tell you? No, I don't have any inside information. I would, I would suspect my, my gut tells me that we're looking at sometime in the first half of 2015 for an IPO from, from Hortonworks. Um, you know, maybe file an S1 sometime in Q1, go public in Q2. That might be the time frame I'm looking at. I've heard some, had some interesting conversations with folks here at the show that think uh, it could be much sooner than that. Uh, simply because, as you mentioned, you, you know, they, it's, it's an arms race to some degree. They need to keep up with the massive investment that Cloudera uh, received from Intel. Um, and they need to raise money to, to, to keep up in that race. So perhaps it could be earlier. My time frame is putting it around uh, maybe late Q1, uh, early Q2 next year. Um, you know, to, to your, your question around or your point around uh, distribution channels and how that could be nullified if one of these big players scoops up you know, one or the other, Cloudera or Hortonworks or, or Mapar for that matter. Um, yeah, again, I, I tend not to agree uh, wholeheartedly with that. I think uh, one of the uh, challenges is, <laughs> one of the challenges is that, um, as you mentioned, one of, if you, one of the dynamics that's happening in the big data space is that uh, people are frustrated by the lock-in that they received, that they, that they got into in the database world, the traditional database world, whether that's with Oracle or with Teradata in the data warehouse space. And I think they don't want to repeat that. That's one of the, uh, one of the, one of the real factors people are considering. Um, so if Oracle were to make an acquisition uh, of one of the, of the Hadoop vendors, I do think that would have an impact on their ability um, to pick up new customers that are not already part of the kind of the red stack and, uh, you know, have that mentality. Um, you know, whether it's as, whether, whether they could continue the growth to some degree, I think probably they could. Um, you know, whether Red Sea part for a Hortonworks in that case, if it was Platter that got acquired by Oracle, maybe not the Red Sea, but you know, maybe, uh, <laughs> maybe a, a, a smaller opening than that. But um, it would be an interesting dynamic. And then it depends on timing as well. I mean, if there's an acquisition a little bit further down the road when the market is more, not quite as frothy and there's less, uh, less hype around it, that could, that could impact things as well. So uh, we'll see. I mean, it's an exciting market to cover. There's a lot happening, um, a lot of moving parts, and a lot can change quickly when, as we saw. Well, I mean, the Intel investment kind of came out of nowhere. Uh, the market was not expecting that. Um, so who knows? Maybe something as dramatic could happen again. All right, Jeff, uh, we're going to wrap there. Uh, so, so stay with us. We'll be here all day today. Uh, Big Data NYC concurrent with Strata plus Hadoop World. Uh, check out crowdchat.net slash bigdatanyc. Obviously check out wikibon.org. Uh, siliconangle.tv has all the videos that we did yesterday. It's going to have, if it doesn't already, I'm sure it does, the panel discussion yesterday and Jeff Kelly's presentation. Check out siliconangle.com for all the news. Keep it right there, everybody. We'll be back with our first guest right after this word. This is theCUBE. <laughs>